Good morning, everyone. I'm Claire Adamson, convener of the Education Skills Committee. Today, we're joined by my colleagues Beatrice Wishart and Jamie Halco Johnson. I'm delighted to welcome the Scottish Youth Parliament here today. With us um, from um, the MSYP, we have Kirsty Morrison, who's the Public and Policy Affairs Manager for the Scottish Youth Parliament, Liam Fowley, MSP, Kilmarnock and Irvine, Martin Carl, MSYP, Aberdeen Donside, Cameron Garrett, MSYP for Gallon Butte, Cam Mackey, MSYP for Glasgow Southside, and Sophie Reid um, from MSYP for Girl Guiding Scotland. So I'm delighted you can all join us today. If you could just let us know who you are when you, you make your first um, contribution this morning, that would be uh, really helpful. Um, and um, we know um, we have five questions to try and work our way through, and we are time limited to an hour today. Uh, because of First Minister's questions in the Chamber shortly. Um, so um, can I um, thank the outreach team and um, for, for all their support this morning and I'm going to move straight to um, the first question um, which I invite Martin Carl to respond to first of all but that was what was been the impact of COVID-19 on learning and what do young people think about the plans to reopen schools? Is Martin there? Yep, thank you. Um, thank my name is Martin Carl. I'm um, MSYP for Aberdeen Dawn site. Um, the impact of COVID on um, young people's learning has been significant and I'd like to go through first of all some barriers which have arisen. Um, motivation and focus is one barrier and to quote young, uh, one young person, since the switch to online learning I've heard from myself and countless others that their work ethic and motivation has completely vanished. Some have also said to us that social media and external distractions have also proven a challenge. Our consultation and research of our partners indicates that not everyone understands or has access to the relevant technology for learning. And this is something particularly important considering the importance of this in enabling pupils progress from home. The levels of interaction and verbal support have also been identified as a barrier, which particularly affects those with additional support needs or who prefer more personal and tailored feedback. Moving on to the plans to reopen schools to highlight some of the key points here. 37% of respondents to a lockdown lowdown mini survey on the topic noted concerns around the safety of returning to school, making it the most frequent concern mentioned in that survey and one which has also been reflected in our own consultation. These are concerns over how schools will um, implement social distancing and um, how they will implement other practicalities and also that these decisions need to be influenced by and communicated clearly to young people. This is also highlighted by significant levels of responses to these consultations which highlight the need for managing expectations and to quote the idea that it is a complicated issue and it won't work for all. An extract from our own consultation. There are mixed views of the idea of a move towards blended learning. On one hand, some are supportive of the plans and believe it to be the safest under the circumstances. And on the other, some are concerned and highlight the danger of catching the virus, especially if they are shielding, vulnerable, live with someone in those categories or are children of public service workers too. One young person commented to Lockdown Lowdown that I am worried that the government will open schools too soon, causing the virus to circulate again, as schools are the perfect place for the coronavirus to spread and thrive. And another to our consultation that there is absolutely no need for schools to be rushed back for what could be a very short return and risk of spiking cases. Finally, some highlighted concerns over phased timetables and the subsequent impact of this on exam season next year. There is also confusion over how this would be enacted, particularly for those who do foundation apprenticeships, who travel to learn, those on the autistic spectrum or with additional support needs. And it's also important to consider the importance of a school routine full time with school a safe haven for those from vulnerable backgrounds and difficult home circumstances. I thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, uh, I'm going to open it up. I can't um, see a chat and I can't see everyone who's on the call. So if people could just sort of jump in and uh, see who they are uh, and hopefully we'll get through some contributions on this topic. Um, so I'm hoping someone will jump in just now. I'm happy to if you if you want. Thanks, Claire. Jamie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Jamie Happy Johnson. I'm a Highlands and Islands MSP. Um, thank you for that, Mark. It's really interesting. I mean, firstly, I was going to ask. Um, firstly, I was going to ask uh, 
how many people the um, lockdown, lowdown went out to and what your proportion of responses, percentage of responses back? Because one of the things that's been very difficult for us to get information from particularly ministers has been um, uh, information on things like, you know, access to technology and the support that um, uh, young people uh, were getting in their learning. So it would be interested in that. You also said there was 37%, I think, concerned with safety, which, you know, um, as one of their primary concerns, which I'm not surprised at, uh, surprised about at all. And of course, safety is vital. I was just wondering if you had any figures for the impact of the people concerned about education, because obviously there's a balance here as well um, with so many young people missing out on their um, education uh, and the impact that that will have, you know, going going forward. Um, so if you've got anything additional on that, that would be would be very helpful, I think. Just before you answer, Martin, sorry, um, I'm just getting to grips with this technology here. I now have access to the chat on my phone. So if people want to contribute, if they could put an R in the chat and uh, I'll call, call them in turn. Sorry about that. Nick, Martin, please come in. Yeah, um, to deal with the first part of your um, question, um, Lockdown Lowdown has been a survey programme that has ran for some time in partnership with um, the Scottish Youth Parliament, with um, Youth Think Scotland and with Young Scott as well. Um, this is comprised of several surveys. So the first, um, and I mentioned as the second statistic I gave, um, was um, received by 2,419 responses. And that was the main survey that covered a range of different topics on the issue. Um, this has been followed up by several mini surveys and um, I can't unfortunately access the, oh sorry, there were 93 responses to that mini survey that's relevant to the question that I answer today. Um, and in terms of the second point of your question, in terms of the statistics that we've got from those surveys about um, how many people are concerned about the, the long term impact on their education, um, the figure for that is 23% and that looks to be the third most prolific um, uh, response um, given um, after the concerns around safety and also the impact of lockdown on mental health as well. Okay, um, can I bring in Miss Wishart? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, convener. Um, I'd like to ask, and uh, good morning and welcome to our um, uh, MSYP colleagues who have joined us this morning. We do appreciate that you have taken the time to, to come and, and uh, give us your views. Um, could I ask a bit about the um, technology deficit? Are you able to expand a bit on that, Martin, as to what exactly um, that means for, for the people who've responded to the, the survey? Yes, certainly. Um, I don't think I can um, obviously speak for everyone who's responded to that survey, but the, the types of things that we would expect to come under that are not understanding how to use the technology or not having enough technological awareness to access things like Google Classroom or other um, facilities. But mm -hmm. there's also uh, a proportion of young people who might not have access to the technology um, at the convenient time for their learning, but also for the fact of not having technology for um, income reasons or for access to technology as well. So there's a range of different reasons that could um, be counted towards that. Mm -hmm. And and could could one of those scenarios be where you've maybe only got one piece of equipment in the household and you've maybe got parents working at home that need to use that access? Would that fit into that kind of um, scenario, that, that situation? Um, yes, definitely. That is something that's come up through some of our survey responses and some um, indicate that there's a balance between parents working from home and pupils being able to progress with their learning at the same time with the same piece of technology. Yeah, and can I sorry? Can I ask? Can I ask also then about the the lack of motivation uh, uh, and work ethic? Um, is there anything particular, any sort of mainstream or uh, or strand that comes out of that? Again, I would say there's a, a variety of reasons that come back from our consultations and from lockdown lowdown on this, um, ranging from things such as um, poor mental health and, and things such as that and challenges towards that, but also the um, idea of those external distractions, having social media. And as I said at the end there, schools considered very much a safe space for young people. Mm. So it's the idea that school is a place where people can go and escape the outside world that they're maybe not being able to achieve at the moment working from home. Thank you. OK, I, I see um, Liam Fowley, MSYP, would like to come in. 
Yes, um, thank you, Kimbia. Um, just to circle back to what um, uh, Mr. Bashart said regarding um, digital exclusion, digital exclusion is something we've um, seen um, very prevalent in all our consultations, be it through lockdown, lowdown, or our individual ones. Um, we've seen quotes like, um, I don't have access to a laptop during the day due to my mum working from home, so I regularly find myself up at 4am trying to keep on top of all of my work. Um, so we've got young people that are, it's not, they've not got access to it, just they've not got access to it at the right times to try and find support with their teachers, um, etc. And then as the other side of it, if they are, say, rural or in an area that doesn't have and good connectivity, they're struggling as well. And um, so digital exclusion is coming in a lot of different forms, um, but it's definitely very prevalent throughout all of our consultation. Thank you. C could I just ask a, a, a question about the plans to return to school? Um, uh, a lot of discussion around those at the moment, and, and um, you know, we're just starting to see some of the plans for some of the local authorities. Um, is, is how do young people feel about um, the possibility of church halls or other um, venues being opened up other than the school, and do they have any concerns about that? And um, and and just in general terms about the blended blended knowledge. Obviously, we've talked about general mental health, the lack of social inclusion, the lack of the ability to 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 have um you know just be with your friends on a, a social level. But um, in, in terms of um, what is causing the most anxiety for young people and, and do you have any indication of what age groups you feel are most directly affected? Is, is it those who are approaching exam years or, or are you seeing that from, from uh, younger pupils in different um, school settings as well? Um, in response to the first part of your question there, I'm not actually certain at the moment on... Um, opinions on returning to things like church halls or returning to different spaces. I'm not sure if any other MSYPs in the group might have um, any responses on that. And in response to the second part, in our consultation in advance of this meeting, age wasn't something that was collected. So I don't have any data from our consultation on um, any particular age groups that were responding. Unfortunately, nor do I have any res particular um, responses on the age groups that were raising some particular concerns. Um, but I do have some statistics on, in general, how many, um, what the proportion of age groups responding to things such as the lockdown, lowdown were. Um, over half of the respondents to um, lockdown, lowdown were aged 15 to 18 um, in age group. And 75% um, of the respondents were actually in school as well. So. Um, those are the statistics in terms of age and in terms of um, response. Um, otherwise, there's other factors as well, which um, statistics can be passed on to you as you feel relevant. Um, but as I say, I'm not sure if any other MSYPs have any responses on the idea of returning to church halls, for example. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing an indication that anyone else wants it at this stage. I think Mr. Halker Johnson may have. I did, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's going back to digital poverty, just be just because it's something that you know we we've been looking at almost since day one, um, and and as as I mentioned, not been able to get a huge amount of information on. I was just wondering if there's any anecdotal evidence that the um, that the situation regards to digital poverty, i.e., those young people that don't have access to the right lap you know laptops or broadband, has improved over the period of lockdown. Because, as I say, at the start of start of um, the process, we were kind of we were given general figures by government on um, uh, you, you know the more kind of social aspect of um, lack of access to internet, etc. And it hasn't really improved uh, a huge amount since. So I don't know if there's if there's any feeling from any any of you that that issue has been, if certainly not addressed, but you know partially improved over the period. Um, yeah. I can I. Can use a, a local example for that, um, if that's okay. I know that uh, there's initiatives in Aberdeen City, for example, to enable as many young people as possible to have access to things such as Chromebooks or um, things such as um, routers for 4G and things like that. So there have been attempts made, um, and that is just an, an anecdotal um, example from Aberdeen City locally. Okay, I think Liam wanted back in as well. Thanks. 
Yeah, um, I'm just circle back to digital exclusion. Um, we know a lot of local authorities are providing um, packs that they know to young people that are unable um, to, to access digital um, resources for whatever reason, um, like a paper versions of activities. Um, and we know there's funding available now um, and young people are trying to access that, to, to get access to laptops. Um, however, the biggest thing I think young people are noticing um, is going to be the, the issue of not knowing that that's there. Um, so there's, it's all well being there, but unfortunately, um, if they don't know it's there, it's difficult to access, um, which has been, I think, the biggest hurdle so far into letting people know. And also Kirsty Morrison would like to come in too. Thanks. Yes, I just wanted to quickly um, say, um, I don't know if the committee has seen Includem's um, report yet um, on digital exclusion. Um, they've done an initial report around the kind of levels of exclusion and I know they're continuing to monitoring these issues with um, people they are working, they are working to get resources out to people um, and they're monitoring that situation. So they might be an organisation that could also help shed light in the committee uh, for the committee on this area. Thank you, that's very helpful. I'm afraid we have to move on to our next question already. Um, time's going very quickly. Uh, and this is, um, uh, what impact has lockdown had on mental health of young people? And um, I'd like to invite Sophie Reid, MSYP, to respond initially. Hi, um, I'm Sophie Reid, MSYP for Girl Guiding Scotland. Um, lockdown has seen a significant impact on mental health and we know that young people are worried about their mental well-being. From the lockdown lowdown report, 39% of young people were moderately or extremely concerned around their own mental well-being. This number has remained consistent during the, our follow-up surveys and was further reflected in this weekend's um, lockdown lowdown mini survey, which specifically asked young people um, this question. Um, this found that the majority of young people who responded have felt a negative impact on their mental health. One of the biggest impacts that lockdown has had has been an increase in loneliness due to the inability to connect with others in person. Many young people have expressed that not being able to see others face to face has effectively taken away a majority of their support network. One respondent commented, we don't realise how much we are impacted by being able to interact with one another, with everyone losing access to their coping mechanisms and the cost constant uncertainty and awful news. It's no surprise people are suffering. Lockdown has also exacerbated um, further pre-existing mental health conditions, um, with many young people feeling theirs have worsened during this time, especially in relation to anxiety. Um, their anxiety young people have also mentioned that their anxiety has increased due to fears around the future. From our own um, consultation, a key um, finding was that many young people have had an increase in anxiety due to the uncertainty around SQA grades um, and also the fact that they can't see their friends and family. There's also been an impact due to support being removed, um, including the school closures um, and not being able to access teachers to help. Um, another respondent um, raised the issue that CAMS has not been in contact with some of my friends who would regularly use their services, which is impacting their mental health because they feel there's nowhere to professionally turn to right now. Um, other young people mentioned that they have been feeling suicidal or feel that they may need to go back to therapy after lockdown due to the situations. Whilst there has been many negative impacts on mental health, some young people have also noted a positive impact um, due to being able to um, get away from their normally busy everyday lives, with one respondent saying the impact on their mental health has been good as it has decreased the amount of school and exam stress. Um, and another noting that the slower pace of life during lockdown has enabled them to start learning healthy coping mechanisms. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That was um, really um, helpful, Sophie. I'm um, just to let you know we do have um, health questions this week, and um, my questions the, the cabinet secretary will be on the issue of mental health. So I'm happy to share um, that session with with you all um, once it's happened um, tomorrow. Um, I, in, in terms of, you mentioned that the support network seems to have fallen away in schools and of course 
when we were looking at a situation we were moving towards hopefully having a counsellor in every school, uh, recognising the support mechanisms, recognising the challenges for young people and, uh, I, and you know, in my, in my own area, having had quite a few cases of, of suicide amongst young men, you know, it's been something that's been very much at the forefront of the work before then. Did, did, are people feeling that that work has completely stalled? Have you any examples of people continuing to get the support they need? Um, or, or do you feel this is, is, is a sort of global situation for, for young people at the moment? Um. I think overall, like the support work, uh, support network in schools has kind of fallen away. Obviously, teachers are still accessible, um, but even for some young people who don't have access to um, the internet, this is a further problem with that as well. But I know um, I live in Glasgow, and I know that Glasgow City Council um, had um, a big white wall it was called um i think online um and any young person in the glasgow city council could access that um and that had trained professionals who you could contact at any time so i think that's um one situation where there has been support put in place when schools are closed okay thank you for that and uh, uh, mr alco johnson wants to come in as well i'm i'm, I'm reverting to my formal Convener's note, and I usually always refer to my members as by the right name. But Jamie, could you come in just now? Thanks. I am sorry if the phone ring. I've, I can't stop the phone ringing at the moment, so apologies for that. Um, and that was really interesting. Thank you so much for that. I was going to ask a couple of things. Um, the CAM thing is particularly worrying because um, you know I've been doing a bit of work in terms of the delays that there were in treatment already and the pressure, and of course that I imagine that will only grow as we go forward. Um, I know one of my colleagues has been doing a lot of work about um, uh, the mental health impact of, of COVID and the pressure that's going to going to be coming on services. Um, I was just going to ask, I mean, in general terms, um, you, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of work being done about making the public aware of COVID, the risks, etc. But of course, actually the risk to younger people is particularly small um you know based on age group do you think young people are more concerned and this is probably a leading question and it's not intended to be but i mean there is obviously going to be concern not only for individuals but about family members and the like but do you think the level of concern from young people over covid actually relates to the risk or do you think we've almost uh, uh, frightened people that we didn't need to um, I think from our own consultation, we saw that young people, and from my consultation, I saw that young people are worried about um, their own family members, especially older family members. And I think that is a particular worry of young people. And I think um, that they do, young people do recognise that there is a significant um, less risk of um, developing COVID-19 and um, having like worse symptoms compared to older people but I think there is like a lot of concern for older family members from what I saw. Okay I've got a couple of members wishing to come in I've got um, Liam first and then Cameron so go to Liam first. Um, thank you and um, Sophie covered um, kind of the general that I was going to mention um, however it definitely fluctuates um, in attitudes so young some young people are generally concerned um, about carrying it into their own household and passing on to vulnerable um, vulnerable people in the, in the household um, but they're also concerned because sometimes the information they get isn't always accessible and um, so they're, they're hearing a lot about the R number as everyone is and all these other things and briefings and as, as clear as these are trying to be sometimes it's just difficult and um, everyone's talking about COVID-19 and um, they find it difficult just to interpret that information and how to, to react to it so that um, definitely contributes to their concerns and worries and, and anxiety when it's not necessarily have to be and um, we are other people are, are trying to combat that and um, but it's definitely prevalent okay Cameron Cameron there still is Cameron still in the call are you on mute you know 
can't hear you, Cameron. No, sorry. Um, are you maybe on mute? Or? Is that better? That's better. That's better. <laughs> it's because my microphone had come unplugged somehow. Anyway, um, so speaking personally here, Argyle and Butte is historically bad at mental health services, um, which is something I'm quite keen to change. Um, so COVID obviously isn't doing any favours in that respect. Um, obviously, I can't speak for the rest of Highland. Maybe Beatrice and Jamie might be able to, being Highland MSPs. Um, but rurality is really going to be playing an issue at the minute um, uh, through inaccessibility and digital connectivity, as we mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and again, we're going to have to, to, to move on to our next question, but um, just, just before we go, I think one of my concerns is that while we know some of the aspects of COVID-19, we're still learning so much about the disease and we're seeing it um, present in uh, different generations in different ways. So although we, we maybe don't have um, the um, impact that it has on, on older populations in terms of you know, ending up in ICU, and we do know that there are risks for young people and we have seen people with um, uh, health problems um, as well, you know, existing health problems who who ha have been, you know, greatly damaged by this. So I guess um, it, it, we're still very much learning about the, the, the risks and the, and the possible impact on young people at this stage. Um, I, if I could move on to question number three, which is, um, what do you think about the process of estimation of grades this year? And I'm going to invite Cameron to speak to that first of all again. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin, and hopefully a more smooth start to this segment um, as my previous question. But anyway, um, firstly, I must make it quite clear that young people's views about the results processed are mixed. This subject is rather widespread as it will be affected to almost half of high school students. The young people we consulted with in the last week who did well on their prelims seemed to be supportive of the idea of estimated grades. One of our consultation respondents said, although using estimates from teachers might leave some students at a disadvantage, I think it's the best way to ensure the majority of students get the grades they deserve. However, pupils who failed or didn't do as well in the prelims as they believed they would have in the final SQA exams weren't so supportive because they feel their prelim grade does not accurately reflect their actual working grade or allow for improvements in the months leading up to the exams. Personally, last year I got a D in my Spanish prelim and got an A in the final exam, so this does happen. Many young people said that pupils do not focus on prelims as they're told they're just a practice run. Instead, they decide to focus on general revision, coursework and unit assessments that decide whether or not they proceed to the final exam. Pupils feel anxious and are struggling to come to terms with the fact that their prelims could now form their grades. In the recent lockdown lowdown report, half of young people said they are moderately to extremely concerned about their exams and coursework. And in addition to this, young people feel worried and are anxious as they don't feel their estimated grades will accurately reflect their full potential. One in 20 young people do not feel they will get the grade they think they deserve. These pupils are worried that the pandemic will also have huge consequences in their future educational and employment prospects, and there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding education in general. One young person said that we've been totally left in the dark. There is also concern around the fairness of awarded grades. A lot of young people are concerned that poor relations with their teachers will likely impact their grades and will put them at a disadvantage. A lot of young people criticise communications over this process, saying they were left confused and not sure what's been taken into account and what's not. There is also confusion around your ability to appeal and where the cutoff is and if they're free. Some teachers haven't been updating pupils on SQA developments and some young people requested more direct methods of communication such as email and text updates. In summary, young people would appreciate better and more robust guidance on this year's results process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I see Beatrice wishes to come in. Beatrice there? I'm not hearing Beatrice. Have you maybe gone to mute? I'm not seeing Beatrice. We'll try and get it in, in a minute. And, and, and Liam, I see you if you want, would like to come in as well. Yes, um, sorry to, to skip the queue almost. Um, the, the exams and process, Cameron Halley, it, it definitely um, it seems to spark a bit of a nerve with young people and they get very frustrated with it. Um, and you ask the question and they'll, and they'll go on, not always, but a lot of the time, 
and um, there's concerns about someone in a better school might get a better grade than me, etc. And it's a lot of comments as people feeling like the decision making process is kind of avoiding them and, and just discussing it in kind of offices elsewhere and it's their decisions, their future they're deciding on, where normally it's the young people's decision by doing the exam. And um, so they're very concerned that these grades um, are these grades are um, being predicted that aren't actually um, reflecting it. And um, there was one for different models. People have done their own research um, and looked um, cross borders and seen um, in other countries how they're trying to combat this as well and feeling that our process is becoming a bit unfair to them. Um, of course, there's a flip side to that and some people feel it's fair and it definitely sparks a bit of a nerve, unfortunately. Yeah, oh, it's obviously been of concern of uh, is to the committee. I'm going to try and bring Beatrice in again, but she's indicated she's having a bit of trouble with the the system. Um, Beatrice, if you're not able I to am, come on. Oh, I'm, here we go. I'm here, yes. Excellent. Yeah, I had this problem with the unmute mute button on a meeting yesterday. It's so I, I must be something at my end. Um, yeah, I was just interested in um, the sort of inconsistency that you were highlighting about the um, about uh, young people being informed as to what the grading system uh, was all about and uh, and the details of that. So, what do you think would help? Is there anything at this stage that would help? Um, any information how that could be um, uh, communicated to you? What what do you think would be needed now? First, I think the information that we've been getting from you know, the SQA and whatever has been long documents, loads of words, not very young people friendly. So the advice needs to be something that young people want to look at, want to read and actually enjoy reading and not get bored and they'll actually get something out of it. Um, and as I said, towards the end, there needs to be more robust guidance um, because it, it's been really, really quite vague um, in the past couple of months or so. Thank From you. your earlier uh, contributions, uh, Cameron, um, it, it seem young people um, maybe feel there's too much emphasis on the prelim results and aren't understanding the, the wider context that was put around the estimation process. Um, would you think that's a fair reflection on where young people are? Yeah, I think a lot of people, young people are thinking that the prelims are going to be their actual result. But obviously what they're not understanding is that coursework and other factors will come into come into play with their final results. I think that definitely needs to be made clearer with young people that the prelims aren't the be all and end all, although they will play a part. Yeah. Liam, would you like to Sorry, yeah, me again. Um, a few um, members that we consulted over the last week um, did say they'd like kind of to have a information provided on exactly um, how their um, individual grades were assessed. So what bit of what coursework they've done throughout the year from the teachers and how the teachers came to that conclusion. So they know themselves what the process was followed. Whereas normally they, they see the exams and they can request their exams back marked. They want to see how their, their own grades are coming informed. Um, SYP's done a lot of work with SQA on this sort of thing, trying to break down the barriers with communication, which has been um, very positive. Um, but it's, we're trying to get to more young people and making sure they can see it. Um, two things there. Thank you. OK, th thank you for that. I'm afraid, again, we're going to have to, to, to move on um, to get through all five topics. And our next question is, what support do disadvantaged young people need most at this moment? And, uh, Liam, you're going to lead on that. Yes, and um, thank you, Kadir. Um, I've kind of these questions have kind of dropped in a lot earlier in the question, so I'll try and be quick as possible. I and mean, I've covered a lot. Um, first thing off the bat, when we ask these questions, is um, we understand we are not experts in the needs of vulnerable people. Young people that responded to the questions also recognise they're not the experts in the needs of vulnerable people, um, and and more consultations to be done with these groups. Um, some of the key things we um, found when we were asking questions related to this um, was that financial support um, was required and um, the educational maintenance allowance stops, SAS stops over summer um, and whilst there's additional funds available and um, they're not always accessible and um, these young people want to be fully prepared for in August a blended learning and, and they want to improve their Wi-Fi, they want to get better technology maybe even get a desk and a chair if necessary and um, so that they're not disadvantaged to the person that might have this. Um, 
also in the classroom. When we asked um, what actions um, we want, they want to, young people want to see taken, and um, it was it was mostly surrounding financial support. And um, to quote people, um, I'm worried about not being able to afford to live off 80% of my small wage in my part-time job. And um, as well as this, there was concerns about young people having to use food banks because they're having to direct their funds elsewhere to their education and um, to prioritise their Wi-Fi, etc. And to make sure they've got a laptop, for example, um, over um, food, unfortunately. Um, another key highlight was additional support from teachers. Um, so um, for young people that are disadvantaged, have caring responsibilities, for example, just a few extra calls from teachers, helping um, organise schedules, maintain workloads, make sure they're doable and they're coping well. Um, they don't have that connection in school at the moment, so they need to be in some um, arrangement for that. Um, some people highlighted they'd like some area where they can go and chill um, uh, with people and um, safe. So a community hall, social distance, uh, play a game or have an Xbox or something as simple as that um, to kind of relax. Um, the additional su pastoral support um, is definitely highlighted. Young people have that. It's a different environment. School, they can go to that. And to quote one young person, school is my safe haven and I've lost it. Um, so they now can't go to school, they can't relax, etc. So um, some form of additional support, face-to-face -face calls. Um, someone suggested a, a helpline, if you like, um, as well. Young people um, told us they're concerned the impact current measures are having on those with additional support needs. Um, and we want more further engagement with those with additional support needs. So they feel like they're being fully understood and um, understood and, and, and valued there. Um, our colleague in committee, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, has responded to SY, um, the Scottish Parliament's Equality and Human Rights Committee um, on highlighting um, the needs of various groups and disadvantaged and marginalised young people in Scotland. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I see uh, Jamie would like to find Jamie Harko Johnson. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and thanks for that, Liam. I was going to ask, I mean, from um, anecdotal evidence through teacher friends of mine, um, they they said there's quite a large proportion, well, a lot, you know, a, a concerning proportion, put it that way, of young people that they've not spoke to, and they've not had any contact with at all. Um, I'm interested, you know, you've obviously um, contacted, uh, uh, you know, a number of young people. But I wonder, on top of that, some of the most vulnerable people aren't actually even coming back to your survey response. And um, I know, say, many have just not had any contact at all, contact at all from um, teachers, despite the best efforts of teachers, who obviously many are working extremely hard. I wonder what can be done to to make sure we're not missing out on these currently missing probably tens of thousands if you, if you look at each uh, if you eat each school because um, of course there are degrees of vulnerability but obviously there are there are some people that are, that are not engaging at all I just wondering what your thoughts or people's thoughts would be about that yes yeah, it's, it's definitely um, concerning um, I don't think I mean I can't speak for individual needs every single person with additional support needs have a different need and they'd want to engage ever so slightly different with their teachers some young people might be incredibly anxious, well, are incredibly anxious by the whole situation and are, are shutting off completely. Um, I've seen it personally um, with, with friends, etc. They're not um, coping well with the situation. They're not getting in touch with um, teachers. They're avoiding them. Um, so the best, uh, the teachers are trying their best, but it's just not working. Yeah. falling through the cracks, if you like. Um, individual talking to them is, is the best way because um, everyone, as you rightly highlighted, is, is everyone's slightly different with this. Um, it's, it's concerning, and um, I think we could all agree with that. Um, but but it's difficult to try and combat it if young people are trying to to learn it. Can I can I come back in very quickly as well, Convener? Yes, of course. Just yeah. th th thanks for that because I think I, I mean I, I absolutely agree with the the, the, the points you made there. Obviously, teachers are going to be as well as everything else they're doing in terms of trying to maintain home learning um, at the moment and or support support that for parents. Um, they are they will be a point of contact. Do you think they've got enough information about some of the things you were talking about there, the financial support, uh, access to digital, help with digital poverty? I mean, is that something you're, you're aware of? You may not be able to comment. But. Um, I, I, I can, can't say I personally know. We don't, um, we, we obviously consult teachers that happen to be under 25, um, but we don't, we haven't in this sort of survey, and um, it's difficult to judge. Um, we only see the kind of receiving end of it um, from young people 
um, and how they are seeing it. It might well be that they're they're highlighted, but these young people are avoiding that, or um, they're not getting the tailored um, responses because teachers are busy and um, they're they're superhumans in their efforts, um, and sometimes things get missed or, or have to be brushed by, unfortunately, which is is, is unfortunate. I think the point made about um, the opportunity for just, just a chill space is really important because very conscious that it's not just school that stopped for young people, it's all, nearly all of the extracurricular activities. And again, you know, organisations are trying to keep things going, like scouts and guides online and everything. If you don't have access to online, you're excluded from those opportunities. So um, thank you very much for that. Very conscious of time. Um, so I'm going to move on to our final question as I don't see anyone else in the chat. So, and it's what's the impact of COVID-19 on young people's plans for the future? And Catherine, you're going to lead on this. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm Catherine Mack, MSYP for Glasgow South Side. After consulting, we found that school pupils and university students are very worried about the impacts of COVID-19 on their plans for the future. For example, school pupils who responded to our survey said they're very worried about meeting the entry requirements to get into college or university and potentially having to change career paths, especially if their estimated grades might not be as high as what their grades would have been in the final May exams. For example, some respondents said I feel as though it will, be too, it will be much more difficult to be accepted into university and to even have a good job afterwards. And also, I think a lot of young people will be disadvantaged by the cancellation of exams and the reliance on these exams for university, college and apprenticeships. Some also noted that they're worried that, they'll, that they've had to make vital life decisions during lockdown without, without all the usual processes involved in such a decision such as choosing which university to attend. One respondent said that, I had to pick my university during lockdown without being able to go to the applicant day as planned. This really put me in turmoil and I still don't know if I made the right decision. Several respondents have seen has changed their plans significantly to pursue certain career or education paths, move out from their parents' home or take a gap year. Some young people also indicated that they might need to leave education to help care for or support their family, including an S4 pupil, who said, for me, it means I can't get a job to save up, which is going to mean I can't afford a deposit to move out like I planned for this year. University students have also responded, saying that they're very, respond they're, they're very worried that the weakening economy will result in them being unable to get graduate level jobs once they graduate, or internships whilst they're studying. For example, one university student in first year said, I'm in my third year at university and feel concerned that my graduate prospects have shrunk dramatically with summer, with summer internships cancelled and a lack of recruitment. Another university student responded saying they felt uncertainty regarding job security and the possibility of getting a job when lockdown is over. Also, personally, as someone who will be starting my third year, my third year studying social sciences at Glasgow Caledonian University, myself and others in my course are very worried that once we graduate, we might struggle to get graduate level jobs due to the weakening economy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was really um, a very comprehensive um, a contribution about, about where we are. Um, I think this is, you know, obviously these, these questions are, are on, on all our minds at the moment in, in terms of, you know, the, 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 what impact there will be in the long term in the economy and what that will mean is particular um, for young people who are moving on in their, their learner journeys and also in, into the workplace. But I, I've got both Jamie and, and Beatrice wanting in to look to Jamie first. Um, well, I didn't. I hadn't actually put an R in there, but I, I do want to oh, re sorry. reply anyway. So, um, thank you. I mean, it, it's it, it's concerning, and I'm not sure whether what kind of encouragement we can give because it's uh, it's an issue that's come up time and time again. Um, you know, I, I've got a shadow education brief um, for, from my party position, and obviously we're dealing with the colleges and the universities uh, in terms of um, the opportunities that they're going to be able to afford uh, to offer. 
young people going forward, particularly if we have, have um, uh, social distancing, which means that the impact of some of the real financial pressures they're under is going to be even greater, even more increased. I think with the universities, it's almost um, while you're missing out on the university experience, you can still do a lot of the courses via online. And that will be the same with some of the college courses. But there's a huge number of those college courses that simply cannot be delivered remotely. And that's a real concern around that and obviously apprenticeships. And I was talking to um, an organization only a few days ago that, of course, not only will there be less opportunities to do or fewer opportunities to do apprenticeships, but those companies that provide apprenticeships will be under financial pressure themselves. There has a lot of work, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done on this, um, you know, to make sure that we've got, you know, an offering for young people and for those in university. And of course, to make sure that the economy is in the right place so that, you know, the jobs are there because the last thing we need, you know, is huge numbers of particularly young people uh, struggling to find jobs right at the start of their career. So I, I doesn't bring any great comfort or hope, uh, comfort, but, you know, I think, you know, we all recognize the severity of the, pro uh, the, the problem and what we need to be doing. Beatrice, do you want to come in? Yeah, I would just echo what Jamie has said, actually. I mean, Catherine, you gave a very um, good comprehensive report there, but I, we are live to many of the issues that have been described. Um, I, that there aren't many answers at the moment, but um, making sure that the economy is on a sound footing so that your generation can get the opportunities and the life experiences that those that have gone before you have had um, is certainly very much our focus. Indeed. Um, one, one of the concerns that we did have, Catherine, and I, I don't know if your survey was able to, to indicate this, is, is that, that a lot of pupil, pupils, a lot of students are deciding not to take the next step uh, and defer for a year. Is, that, is a, 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 an impact that would have on our universities, who of course, are, and colleges of course, um, who are also facing um, the possibility of a decline in um, students from out with the UK um and, and the problems that that will bring to them but uh, are you getting a sense of the level of the deferrals um i'm not completely sure about deferrals but some respondents definitely noted that they're very worried that they'll not get the grades needed to get into university so they might have to repeat a year or have to change career plans or maybe let's say go to college before going to university mm -hmm change your plans completely. I know that personally, if I had been in Essex right now, back when I was in Essex, one of my conditions to get into the Vasco Cali was to get a C at Nat 5 life skills maths. The mother in my prelim was a D and then I managed to get the C to meet the conditions. And I know that if I hadn't, if I hadn't have been the, sorry, I can hear an echo, so I'm right, okay. So if I had been in this generation, I would have been Snookers, I wouldn't have gotten into Cali and I would have had to feed contingency plans. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah. I, th I think we should emphasise that the, the, the evidence we are getting from the SQE and what the vast of teachers is yes, the prelim plays a part, but they, they are looking to look holistically at the, the pupil. I know the pupil and to make an estimation based on, on, on like your own. And I think Cameron mentioned earlier the same for him. Where, where, where the prelim had been a great result, but but they were you and, and and he were both able to pull themselves back. So I think I, th I think it's worth emphasising that you know it's not just prelim for young people because I think that you you, you know just compounds some of those anxieties and and um we, 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 at the moment we're waiting to see, but we're trusting that the teachers have done their jobs diligently, which you'd expect to happen. And they were waiting to see what the outcome is um, from the SQE uh, and, and look, look to what's happening in the summer. And uh, I, would, I would say, I think our universities and colleges are cognizant of the fact that it's not been a normal year for young people either. Um, indeed, they, you know, very early on, some of the, the Further and High Institutes took the decision not to have an exam diet for, for the first and second year pupils uh, and their students on the basis that that you know they they were confident by the end of of the degree or the the, the diploma phase they would be able to get people to a particular standard 
Um, as Jamie said, that becomes more difficult when you're looking at practical um, apprenticeship based mm -hmm. qualifications and also um, those that are, involved a, a huge degree of, um, you know, the, the, the sort of physical intervention in terms of science and, um, you know, some of the craft subjects, arts, all, all of these areas where, where we've just not been able to, to do those assessments. So, um, you know, I, I really appreciate that, you, you, you know, your contribution in, in terms of how comprehensive that was about, about the anxieties and the problems that young people are facing and thinking about at the moment. So um, I'm looking, I, I don't see anyone else to, um, oh no, Martin wanted to come in, sorry. Martin. Um, yes, I think it was just something, it, it was a comment that I wanted to make based off the back of um, um, discussing things like um, not having exams and things across all points of transition. Um, I am a final year university student and have had to um, still complete dissertations and still complete exams and things. And I think for some universities and for some colleges and things, that's been something that they've had to continue through as well. Um, but what I, I think is worth commenting on is the fact that they've tried to put as many procedures in as possible. And um, obviously it's different by, by each university in terms of who they're examining and how they're grading things. But um, I can speak for my local university when they've put as many measures in place as possible to ensure that um, young people's future weren't being disadvantaged and that things that grades were being accounted for at different scales and, and with different criteria against them. So I think it's just worth highlighting that um, there has been an attempt across all points of transition, both school and university, to try and counter the anxieties and to try and counter that as well. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I missed Sophie wanting to come in earlier. Yeah, so. Um, I'm personally going into um, Essex after the summer and I know from um, hearing friends who are also going into the same year that there's lots of worry about next year's exam day as well as this year's mm -hmm. um, with people not knowing, knowing whether this will go ahead go ahead even um, or if it will go ahead but just um, differently than normal um, and I think I'll, there's a lot of concern that um, that young people's fifth year and sixth year exams won't be um, as normal and this will really affect in the future um, and especially next year if they do go ahead um, but schools are running with um, blended learning um, from home and school this will really affect it as well so I think there's a lot of concern um, in my age group that um, two years worth of exams will be affected. Yeah. Yeah, and um, Catherine wanted to come back as well. Uh, yeah, to also echo Martin's point about universities. Um, I'm studying at Cali and we've, Cali's been very supportive and we've had our online learning and it worked very well when their exams were all cancelled and our grades were just based off of coursework. So that was very decent, actually. We felt very, I personally felt very calm after that because it's coursework and they've been taught what to do for the essays that they had to still hand in. So that was very good. And I think other universities have also been very helpful too. But um, I think for the future, our worry is more about can we get internships? Because internships are, if companies can't even afford to run, will they even be able to run internships like normal? Because it's hard enough to get internships. If you're a third year student, let alone if companies are shutting down and then they might not be able to afford to offer internships to students, it might be even more of a race to the bottom for internships and even more of a race to try and get a graduate level job once you graduate because it's a lot of people are, well before COVID people were worried anyway about getting graduate level jobs. Brexit as well. That was worrying people. What about getting a job? I think COVID, along with that, it's also making it very worrying for students that we're mm -hmm. really going to struggle to get graduate level jobs. Yeah, it's 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 a big 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 challenge. As someone who was in your situation in the eighties, and um, we were facing sort of levels of unemployment and drops in the economy that we've seen. Um, I remember having very 
very much those concerns myself at that time. But thank you for that. I'm afraid we're going to have to, to move to our final agenda item. Um, and that's an update on the PSE report. And I think uh, Liam's going to lead on this. Yes, um, thank you, Gunia. And it's just to highlight actually, a few things. Um, I'm not promise I won't hijack the meeting. I apologise. My dog's decided now's the opportunity she wants fed. If the soil has any noise, um, he launched a um, recommendation, uh, a PSE report, and uh, consultation earlier in the year. Um, uh, a couple of members led on that in the meeting actually. Um, and March it was ready for launch. We kind of pushed it back a wee bit until just um, a couple of weeks ago. And we found six recommendations about PSE. We are aware that. Your committee has done a, a, a review as well, um, but we decided it's still very prevalent and there's still um, fundamental issues with it. Recommendations include um, set curriculums, um, more lessons focused on mental, social, emotional and physical well-being, um, focus more lessons on life after school, more on sexual health relations, etc. Um, I don't want to take too long, so I invite you, I'll, I'll send it over to you as well, I invite you to all have a, a good look at that. Um, our committee has also um, put out um, two members' motions for um, uh, to the rest of the Scottish Parliament to become policy. They surround um, the attainment gap and resourcing to ensure it doesn't widen in the aftermath of COVID-19, um, and they surround um, uh, adequate support um, to be provided to young people making the transition from school to university, college or employment, etc. And as well as that, um, in terms of attainment gap and other education needs, um, we are asking more in light of COVID-19 and our manifesto, which is our most important um, policy making um, mechanism um, that we do every five years. Um, so when we urge out the findings of these um, and we start to act on it, um, we look forward to working with the committee um, and all of that. Thank you very much for taking the time as well to listen to young people um, in, in this um, setting. And it does, it does really mean a lot. No, um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just looking to see if Beatrice or Jamie want to make a final comment. I'll bring them in. Um, we absolutely value our time with the Scottish Youth Parliament. You've contributed uh, in my time and on the Education Committee to so many of our reports and, uh, and, and we couldn't produce the work that we do without your contributions. So, um, so thank you very much for taking the opportunity to come and speak with the committee this morning. And um, as predicted, Jamie and Beatrice would both want to say something to you. bring uh, Beatrice in first. Yeah, well, I just want to echo what you've said, Claire. And I mean, although I'm relatively new to to this, um, uh, th these proceedings having only been elected last uh, August, um, I have found it very valuable to hear um, the views of young people and the, uh, the input from the Scottish Youth Parliament. So, and I do thank you very much for your time this morning. It's been very helpful. Jamie? Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it, we can sometimes feel very um, distant, apart from kind of friends and family and anecdotal evidence. If we feel very distant from some of the people on the call face, it's really useful to get that um, uh, experience and feedback, particularly as you're, you know, funneling information into it from your from your members and uh, and young people. So thank you very much, and um, I look forward to hearing more from you all very soon. And, and thank you for, for, for the survey work because um, it's not something we've got the capacity to do and certainly not something we're seeing be done elsewhere. So that um, survey was absolutely invaluable and um, we'll make sure that it's shared in the session. Information is shared to the committee this morning.